All right, good morning, Grace Life. Hope we're doing well this morning. Let's go ahead and stand together. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. And as we uh, remember this day, our uh, Grace Life 8th uh, birthday today, um, something we're celebrating. And um, remember that you are, we celebrate in this building, which we call church. But remember that you are the church. Jesus lives in each and every one of us who has called up and believed in faith in Jesus Christ. And that is what we celebrate, the church that Jesus lives in us together. Uh, verse for, uh, I'm going to read this morning as we start our time is uh, Psalm 29, verse 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in his uh, splendor of holiness.
Yes, God, we praise you. We thank you for just who you are and what you've done and what you are doing and continue to do. Just be with us this morning as we continue to celebrate uh, the power of your name and just the, the beauty of uh, the church that you have gathered, the people you've gathered here to encourage one another, to uh, sing songs and praise together, to read God's word together with you, to pray together and to uh, just keep our gaze focused on you. Be with us as we continue through uh, this morning's worship. We love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our verse that we're reading together this month is Jeremiah 17:7. 7. Let's read it together. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord.
for what you've done, that finished work on the cross, where we can truly sing and say, hallelujah, the risen one, son of God, we thank you, Jesus, that you took our place on the cross, that we're here to celebrate, in your name, Jesus, we say these things, amen. We repeat the Apostles' Creed. We are not just using a form of words that meant something to somebody a long time ago. No, we are saying something that we do honestly hold ourselves to be true. We are not just giving expression to the historic faith of the church, but we are giving expression to our faith. We are saying that the truths of the Bible is what we ourselves believe. We believe for ourselves, knowing that we cannot be saved by another's faith. Why do you call God Almighty and Maker? I call God Almighty and Maker because by his almighty word, he made all things out of nothing. Hebrews 11.3 states, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, 
so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible? Let's read the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday, Grace Life. You got... Thank you. You guys will remember this song. This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Hey. <laughs> thank you. Happy eighth birthday. So, look, we want to say thank you to those that are with us today, uh, especially on this day celebrating our eighth birthday. We'd love for you to drop your connection card in the bucket on your way out today so we can say thank you for spending this time with us. It's truly an honor to have you with us. And as a church, we're committed to worshiping Jesus Christ. And we love for you to join our family and go on that journey with us. I'd like to go ahead and dismiss our kids. They'll be with Miss Melanie today. They're learning how God can always be trusted from Jeremiah 31. So the lesson and the memory verse are in our app and the resources provided. So make sure that you review that with them this week. You guys can follow along with me on your sermon notes if you want. So tonight we've got student ministry. They'll be in Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through 22. So life groups this week, we're in Galatians 3, 23 through 26. Those resources can be found on your app as well. Uh, if you're not yet a part of a, a life group and you'd like to learn more, please get with Pastor Matt or Pastor Ben. We'd love to direct you to a life group that will work best for you. Um, many blessings coming from that. College nights are next Sunday, February the 19th. 6 p.m. at Pastor Matt's house. You know, we want to say thank you to everyone who brought in, you know, something, a gift for the tribute offering. Uh, if you weren't able to bring in a gift today, you can always order anything that is remaining or make a donation to a, a specific item on the list. We will keep that up on the app for a little while. Uh, don't forget, we're going to be enjoying cupcakes right after the service in celebration of the birthday. Uh, for any additional events, you can see the church app for upcoming events and be able to take your next step. So uh, I want to say thank you for the, our weekly giving. These giving, you know, giving fuels the mission of our church. You can give online at thegracelifechurch.org forward slash give in the app or in the bucket in the back in the hospitality counter. Let's take time to pray for our offerings and for the word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, the bright and morning star, we're so thankful that we can come together as a church family, God, and worship you and celebrate you. God, we're thankful for the generous hearts that are within our church that give to help further your kingdom. God, we're especially thankful for those that gave a little extra for the tribute offering. It means so much to our church to be able to provide what our church family needs and to be able to honor you. God, we ask you as we take time to hear your word this morning, that you set our minds and our hearts right. Have the Holy Spirit work throughout us, God, and to recognize that we're spending this time in worship of you. You are our King of kings, and we owe everything to you. God, we're so thankful not only for our birthday, but for the rebirth days that our church family has. And God, we just want to continue to grow your kingdom and bring more people to heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, as Darren said, happy birthday, Grace Life. Uh, I'm not going to sing for you. I'm not that brave, that's for sure. But man, it is, it is hard for me to put into words what it is to celebrate eight years as a church Eight years ago this past week, a few of us 
gathered uh, on for the first Sunday uh, as a church. We've been p- preparing for months before that, uh, but we gathered for the first time on a Sunday morning over at Lake Asbury Elementary School. It's hard to think that some of you never were a part of our church at the elementary school, which we spent so many years there until COVID interrupted interrupted that. Um, but man, it is it is. Hard to imagine eight years. That first Sunday was both incredible and quite scary because um, you, you're starting this new thing. You're like, I hope this works. And then eight years later, all you can do is just celebrate God's faithfulness because you, Julie and I know and a few others know just everything that can occur. And all the, uh, along the way, I think the one thing I keep going back to is God is always faithful to his people, always faithful to his people. Leading up to that first Sunday, Back in February of 2015, there was, it was me, Julie, and I probably just Julie's brother, Jeremy, missionary to Ethiopia, that we're, we're kind of praying through what this looked like. And after we came up with the name and kind of an idea of where we're going to be, that's not quite enough to start a church, a name and a location. We started praying through, what do, what do we want to see God do in this church? What do we want Grace Life Church to be? And I wrote this list down, and if you read our weekly blog, you would have read these things. It says who we are. We are a church who ultimately desires to bring all glory to God. We are a church that focuses on the gospel and seeing the gospel change lives. We are a church that wants to see believers in Christ grow in their faith. We are a church that makes disciples, that makes disciples and plants churches that plant churches. We are a church that loves and shows grace to broken people. We are a church that thrives in community with each other as we grow together. We are a church that serves in the church, community, and around the world globally. We are a church that makes much of Jesus and less of us. I read this list around this time every year, just as a reminder, kind of just see, hey, this is who we wanted to be from the beginning. Those truths still remain no matter how old we are. And While, yes, there is a lot for us to continue to do and to grow. I mean, we're only eight years old, so we still have lots of years ahead of us. I am thankful for God's faithfulness towards us, and I'm encouraged how he's worked in us and, and through us. I believe I can summarize these core values, these lists, these eight statements with this statement. We seek to be a church faithful to the one who is always faithful to us. We seek to be a church faithful to the one who is always faithful to us. And that sentence is really at the heart of this series that we're going to begin today through the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. At the heart of this message is we are to be faithful to the one who is always faithful to us. We know that God has never let his people down. Not once. If he let his people down just one time, he ceases to be God. God is always faithful to his people. And he calls and invites us, hey, to be faithful to him. So as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to continue to look at how we can be faithful to the one who is always faithful to us. Now, before we get into reading the text, a little background on this sermon series. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, for quite some time. Mira on the way here asked me, how long are we going to be in this series? I said, I don't know. Merritt turns eight next month. I was like, you could be 10 or 11. I don't know. You could be nine. <laughs> Here's the plan for it. I'm just going to preach what God's word says, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit lead us along the way. Amen. When we're not on the Sermon on the Mount, we'll be in the seven churches of Revelation which Pastor Ben started last week and did an incredible job just setting our minds on the coming king. So we'll have men from our church preaching this um, every once in a while through the seven churches of Revelation. And the second, the the next thing that I'm just really encouraged by and excited about is the series graphic that you see here was hand-drawn by one of our college students, Layla Roman. I asked her a couple months, we were a couple months ago, we were at the college nights, and we were talking about how worship using our gifts is, is not just singing or preaching, that there's some people have gifts that can be used for the good of the church and the glory of God, and then I find out she can draw. So I'm like, hey, would you be up for drawing this 
graphic that we use on the TV and the website and social media for our church for this series. And she did, and she did an incredible job on this. Yeah, I want to uh, just give her a shout out there, all right? Because here's what I see. I see young college students. I have to say young now because I am older. So I feel like I'm still 19, 20, 21. My body says otherwise. And I see that. I'm like, she's using her gifts for the good of the church and the glory of God. And no one else in the world has this graphic. So I'm like, that's really cool to me. Uh, so I'm encouraged to see our college students, students use their gifts to serve, whether it's drawing or being in the band or pressing the buttons on the space bar so we can get to the next slide uh, throughout the sermon series or taking pictures as if you see Jacob or Tristan with the camera, please smile. This, it could be on the website, all right? And I'm thankful that they're using this, these gifts. So let's set the scene for the Sermon on the Mount by beginning our reading with Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to read through verse 12 of chapter 5. We're not going to read the entire sermon today. We'll get to that eventually. So let's begin Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and we'll read through Matthew 5, verse 12, and then we'll respond to the reading of God's word. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he, Jesus, said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boats and their father and followed him. And he, Jesus, went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to be honest. It's quite intimidating to be preaching a sermon series on the greatest sermon ever preached. Specifically one that Jesus preached. So I come at this knowing that I'm just not going to be doing quite as good of a job as the one who originally preached it. Jesus, in Matthew's timeline, has just begun his ministry. We saw the beginning, the genealogy. We see the angel coming to Joseph, telling him that the baby's going to be born. We see in his birth, we see the wise men coming, and we see John the Baptist, and we see Jesus' temptation. So according to Matthew's timeline, he's just begun his earthly ministry. He's just called the disciples that we just read about. He's been healing people around the area. And he's preaching a message. This is the message that Jesus preaches. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is going around seeing people, and this is the message he is preaching. The first word of this message is repent. He's calling sinners to repentance. Repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he's performing all these miracles and healing people and doing all these signs and wonders, the crowd begins to follow him. And he gets to a point and he ascends up to the Mount of Beatitudes, what it is known now, to teach them. Here's a picture of what the, where Jesus likely preached the Sermon on the Mount over in the Galilee, Judea area. You can see this area, and that's known as the Mount of Beatitudes. It's a beautiful view of uh, the Sea of Galilee, and in the back, those, you could see the mountains vaguely. It's probably where Jesus cast the swine into the demons into the sea. It's this beautiful area. I mean, Jesus got a pretty good preaching view. It's a little better than ours, I'm going to say. So the crowds begin to close in, and he ascends up into the mountain to preach to these crowds that have been following, because he'd become quite famous for all that he would have been saying and, and doing. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically call this sermon the Sermon on the Mount. It's just what we've attributed it to. The first one that probably gave the name, the Sermon of the Mount, to these chapters in Matthew was probably Augustine in the 4th century. The Sermon on the Mount is the first of five sermons preached by Jesus in the book of Matthew, and they all have the same theme. You want to guess what the theme is? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' sermons carried the same theme throughout the entire book. Now, the Sermon on the Mount that we have in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, most likely, though we don't know this, but most likely, they are summary points of a much larger sermon. If it was, which it could be, if it was exactly what Jesus said on that mount, then it would probably take him 10 minutes to preach. So part of me is hoping that Jesus spent a much longer time preaching than just 10 minutes. And it's also why it's going to take a mere man like me 45 minutes just to get through verses 1 and 2, all right? John Stott said, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably it is the least understood, and certainly it is the least obeyed. It is the nearest thing to a manifesto that Jesus ever uttered, for it is his own, for it is his own description of what he wanted his followers to be and to do. With every sermon, even the sermons that I preach or someone else preaches, there are three components. There is the preacher. There is the audience. That's you guys. All right. Just you guys with me today? Yep. I'll get the cupcakes out now if we have to <laughs> get you guys going. All right. And then you have a message. So you have the preacher, the audience, and the message. And we're going to work through those, those three components of Jesus' sermon so we can establish the entire sermon as a whole. The Sermon on the Mount reveals to us the heart of Jesus. We learn a lot about Jesus just from these first two verses in Matthew chapter 5. Oftentimes when we see the beginning of a chapter, we see kind of some transitionary words. We kind of skip over them without just sitting in there and unpacking what these words are saying. The first thing we see is what Jesus sees. Jesus seeing the crowds. Jesus sees people that need a Savior. And from this statement, Jesus seeing the crowds, we see that Jesus desires to show his love for us. We need to understand the fame that Jesus had in this time period. He is going around he healing people. He is casting out demons. He is putting his hands on people, and they are beginning to walk and to see and to stop having their, there's epileptics. There's, this is incredible. If you were in town... And someone said, hey, there's this guy in here. He's a miracle worker. He's just healing people. Are you not going to be just slightly curious to see if it's true? And they go out and you see it and you're like, man, my mom could really use a miracle worker. So then you go get someone you know. And it, so you can see why crowds are following Jesus. They're seeing things they've never seen before. They're seeing people walk who have never walked before. What that must have been like for those people who have these lifelong ailments and they get up and they can just walk? No wonder Jesus became famous around the town. And all the people are following him. They want to maybe see, what is, who is this guy that can do this? Maybe they want to say, you know what, I've got this ailment. I need healing. They are broken hurting, 
down and out, the least of these people, they are not wealthy people. They are not powerful people. They are people who need help, and Jesus loves them. Throughout the book of Matthew, when we see Jesus, often it says Jesus seeing the crowds, it's often connected to his compassionate heart. Let me read Matthew 9, 36, and from Matthew 15. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. A couple chapters later, then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. We see Jesus' love for all people. Jesus loves them. He doesn't push them away. He's like, he doesn't get, you're crowding me, leave me alone. He, he welcomes them and he draws them to himself. Jesus' compassion for people is not just a surface level feeling that so many of us often have towards people. When we say we love people, but then we just say it, maybe we don't show it. Jesus has a, when we see compassion, we see a deep pity for people who need something. Jesus knows what these people ultimately need is not physical healing, but a spiritual savior, and he is that person for them. And it's this reminder that Jesus loves us. He loves us. He loves you. We, we should just, we could just stop right there and just talk about that Jesus loves us, the son of God, loves a sinner like me and you. He loves us. How many of us are just longing to be loved? Mamas, in the middle of the day, when these kids do not show their love for you, or their appreciation for you, and they often say other words towards you, your Savior Jesus loves you. Teenagers, when you don't feel like anyone loves you, and you feel alone, Jesus loves you. Parents who have, their kids have moved out and they don't call back. I just got in trouble for this yesterday by my own mom. It's a reminder that Jesus loves you. Seniors, as you grow older and you want to see your grandkids and your great-grandkids even, and you're just hoping someone will show some love, Jesus always loves you always loves you with a compassion far greater than any compassion we will see on this earth. Jesus loves you. And he loves us because he has made himself known to us. Jesus has a desire to make himself known to us. There, there are times throughout the Gospels that Jesus wants to get away from the crowds. And it's good. He has been busy doing the Lord's work, and he shows us the importance of rest and getting away and spending time with the Father. But Jesus did not come to avoid the crowds. He came to be with the crowds, to walk among them, to show the people his authority, his love, why he came to come to this earth to share the message of repentance. It also reminds us that for all of eternity, Jesus was with the Father. He was not born and came into existence. He has always existed with the Father. And then he made his presence known on the earth he created. Jesus made his presence known to sinners. He walked among them. He visibly was seen and heard. John chapter 1 verse 14 that says that Jesus came and he tabernacled among people. He, he set up camp. He came and dwelt among people. And here he climbs up a mountain. He sees the people, people that need him. And he climbs up a mountain. Not so he could see them, but so that the people could see him. He is making himself known. He is making his presence known. He is making sure that sinners see the Savior that they need. And I can't imagine the scene on that grassy hill. Wherever Jesus stood, he gets up so that everybody can see him. And the parallels between Matthew chapter 5 through 7 
compared to Exodus chapter 19 and 20 are quite remarkable. In fact, we'll be referring to Exodus chapter 19 and 20 throughout the next several months, years, I don't know, and as we work through the Sermon on the Mount. In Exodus chapter 19, Moses and the people of Israel have gotten to a point called Mount Sinai. They have left. God has delivered them from Egypt. They've crossed over the Red Sea. The Pharaoh and his army has been destroyed, and they're wandering in the wilderness. And they get to Mount Sinai, and God says, I want, Moses, I want you to make the people consecrate themselves. They need to prepare and clean up. Clean up. We're about to have a meeting, and they're going to be with me. Make sure they don't touch the mountain, or they're going to die. After three days, which is really cool comparison, that when we see three days throughout the Old Testament in God's redemptive story, because something else happened is a big deal after three days. It's the resurrection, just in case you guys were wondering. <laughs> after three days, God's going to come down onto the mountain. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 12, it says, God says this to Moses, You shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Why? Because God's presence is on the mountain. And sinners cannot come into the presence of a holy God. That is, until we get to Jesus. Which is really cool. Jesus shows us God's presence on earth. In Exodus chapter 19 and 20, God descends. There is thunder and lightning in a thick cloud of smoke because God descended by fire. You ever been out in a lightning storm? What's your first reaction? Oof, right? Just like one little strike of lightning. Imagine Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 and 20 when God shows up. Like the Israelites, we would have the same response. They trembled with fear. There is nowhere to hide. Adam and Eve, when God came up in the same way, all they knew, I have to hide because I'm a sinner and God is holy. And if I come close, I'm going to die. Exodus 20, 18 through 21, after God's given the Ten Commandments to Moses, it says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. We get that, right? Like, yeah. God said, don't touch the mountain or you'll die, and now I get it. I don't want to even be touching the ground connected to the mountain. And the people said to Moses, you speak for us, and we will listen. We also know they're liars, too, all right? We just, we'll learn that later on. They did not listen. You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Do you see, hundreds of years later, there is quite a difference from Mount Sinai to the mountain where the sermon was preached. In the Mount Sinai, God comes down and it's, it's wrath, it's scary, it's, there's lightning and fire. And everybody's like, whoa, I can't get close to a holy God. But then in the Sermon on the Mount, it is the same holy God. He is God without sin, Jesus Christ. And he is touching people and they aren't dying. He is speaking and they're not dying. They are coming close to him and they're not dying. Why? Because that's the only way through Jesus that we can come close to a holy God. Because he came close to us. He made his presence known to us. Jesus isn't less holy as God was in Exodus 19 and 20. He is still holy. I mean, those hands touched ears and touched eyes and touched legs and hugged people. And probably fist bump or shook hands or however they greeted each other when they saw their buddies. And these people didn't die. And then he speaks. And at the end of chapter 7, after Jesus finishes, the people's response is, I can't hear any more of God. The, the response is awe and wonder. Matthew 7, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who had authority. Not as the scribes. He's visible to the eye of the people, but not in fire or smoke, in human form. 
The presence of God in the Old Testament often brought fear and trembling to his people. But the presence of God in the New Testament brought awe and wonder. But what we don't see is that same response in Exodus 19, 20 should be our response when we see that Jesus is holy God who came to preach a message of repentance. And if we do not repent, then one day we will stand before God in awe and, trim, in awe and fear and trembling. The awe that these people had for Jesus was because he was one who had authority. Why? Because Jesus desires to display his authority over all things. Jesus sees the crowd. He climbs up a mountain. And then notice what the texts say. There's this interesting detail. What does Jesus do when he finds a spot? He sits down. It's kind of weird, right? It's kind of hard to see me sitting down. Well, in Jesus' day and age, sitting down was a place of authority. The rabbis, when they're teaching in the synagogue, they come and they sit, they would read the scripture and then they would sit down and carry on this conversation and teach what scripture said. And everybody in the room knows this rabbi, this teacher had authority. So Jesus walks up on the mountain and he sits down. That is a statement that Jesus is making. He is saying, I have authority just like the rabbis and teachers do. But my authority is greater. My authority comes from God the Father. We see Matthew 28 when he says, all authority has been given to me. And Jesus is about to sit down and he's about to teach. And what he is saying when he sits down and says, you better listen up because what I'm about to say matters. It is authoritative teaching. Just this little note that Matthew leaves us and he sat down shows us that this is authority. These words that Jesus is teaching, that we're going to be learning and studying for ourselves, words that came out of the mouth of our Savior, are to be learned and applied. And Jesus, as he sits down, signifying that what he's about to say carries great and significant weight to the audience, because Jesus desires to speak the words of God. Jewish listeners are very familiar with the Old Testament prophets. If you read through the Old Testament, some of you are doing the, Old Test the, the five day reading plan. We're in Exodus right now, unless you're a super reader, then you might make it to Leviticus, which then you'll slow down and we'll catch up to you eventually. But you get to the other side of David and King Solomon, you get to the prophets. These prophets would come and they would proclaim a message from God. And in order to distinguish their normal words, and the words of God, they would start their, like, I'm about to say some words from God, just so we're clear. They would say this, thus says the Lord, or something to that effect. That way, if they went into a sandwich shop and they were like, I want, uh, I was about to say ham sandwich, but they would not eat a ham sandwich. <laughs> they want a sandwich, some pita. The, the people behind the counter would be like, are those God's words? Or? So they would clarify, these are God's words by saying, thus says the Lord. So then everybody would know. This man speaking God's words. What I find interesting is Jesus gets up and just starts speaking. There's no clarifying, hey, these aren't my words. Just want to clarify. It's not my words, but God's words. He's in his speaking, in his authority, declaring, my words are God's words. Only God can come and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he makes himself known, he is speaking the words of God, meaning that the Content of the Sermon on the Mount, when we talk about marriage and money and everything in between, they're not just suggestive ways of living. They are the words of God for us today. And we are to listen and apply them to our lives. And when a sermon is preached, you need to know the audience. When I go and preach to high schoolers, I know I have to preach. I'm changing the sermon, not the content of the scripture, but the application 
to line up with what they would understand. I'm preaching this message to Grace Life Church. If I were to preach it somewhere else, I would change probably the application of it just a little bit because the audience is different. Jesus knows his audience. And the Sermon on the Mount is a message for those of us who follow Jesus today. There's two groups in attendance. You have the crowds that we see in Matthew 4, 25 through 28. They're mentioned first, seeing the crowds. He went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, there's another group that's there. His disciples came to him. So we have two groups in attendance. The crowds of people from Matthew 4, 25, 23 through 28, and the disciples from Matthew 4, 18 through 22. Now, the disciples could have been just the 12, or it could have been Jesus had other disciples that followed him. He would send out more than 12, but the 12 are what we know. So it could be 12, it could be 50 or 75, but we have crowds and disciples. We see that distinction in the text. The crowds are following Jesus because of what he has done. You follow someone that can cast out demons and cast out uh, and fix legs and, and heal blindness. The disciples are following Jesus because of who he is. There is a difference there, a contrasting difference. Some people follow Jesus because of maybe he'll do something for them. Other people follow Jesus because of who he is, the Son of God who came to save and, and, and free us from our sins. The Sermon on the Mount is ultim ultimately about who Jesus is. And his message is for the disciples, not for the crowds. Let me explain, because the crowds are there, right? When Jesus sits down, Matthew separates the two groups for us. Seeing the crowds... He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So you have crowds and disciples. They're two different groups. And in verse 2, he says, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. That them, taught them, is going to connect to the most recent group of people mentioned, which is the disciples. So Jesus is teaching his disciples. The contents of the Sermon on the Mount are for the true followers of Jesus, not the crowds, not people on the outside. Jesus seeks disciples, not a crowd of followers. The moment has come to, do, to describe for Jesus, this is what the life of a faithful disciple looks like. And because the message of the Sermon on the Mount is intended for his disciples, then Jesus does not expect those who do not belong to him to live in this manner unless they repent. We get the gospel wrong when we think that people who have not repented of their sin, who have not confessed Jesus as their Savior, we get the gospel wrong when we say lost sinners should live like Jesus. They can't. When the Holy Spirit does not dwell in them, they cannot produce good fruit. So when we say, here, person, you are lost. You are dead in your sins. You want nothing to do with Jesus. You're not confessing that he is the Son of God. You better live a certain way. That's getting the gospel wrong. We should not be surprised that sinners live like sinners. Right? Like, we see the wickedness of our world. This is what a sinful world looks like for those who are apart from Jesus. The message of the gospel is a message of repentance. It starts there. Repent. And if you repent, then this is what the life of repentance looks like. This is what it looks like to live faithfully to the one who faithfully saved you. So instead of telling your child, your friend, your neighbor, you got to live like Jesus, you need to first call them to repentance. Until then, they are not able to live the way Jesus intends for them to live. I think in our culture, I'll try to carefully say this, and I don't have a lot of time, and we're going to have plenty of time to talk about this throughout the Sermon on the Mount. There is an effort from politically to change the way people live. But from a Christian perspective, no matter how much behavior change we force or ask people to do, if it is not coming from a repentive heart, then it's never going to hold. Does that, is that clear? Yes, like we are placing this expectation on people to be a good Christian person, and they have not repented of their sins. The Sermon on the Mount is not a message 
for those who have not repented. And I think that's why so many people of the crowds, like we see in John chapter 6, they hear the message of the repentance. They see what is expected of them. And in John chapter 6, we see the whole chapter at the beginning starts with the crowds. And it all dwindles. Till the very end, it's just Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus says, are you going to go too? Is this too much for you? Is it too much to live faithfully? And these 12, and then it says, and one of them was Judas, who eventually betrayed Jesus. He says, no, we will follow you wherever you call us to go. Because true followers of Jesus don't see the contents of the Sermon on the Mount as something unbearable to do. They see it as a joyful way of living because their faithful God has called them to a life of abundance. So, if you're here today and you are a true follower of Jesus, you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then the Sermon on the Mount is for you. It is how we are to live. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. That's talking about those of us who are following Jesus. If you're here today and you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of, the, of your sins, the message of the Sermon on the Mount is not for you. But I want it to be for you. But for it to be for you, the first thing we must do is repent. Confess that we are sinners in need of a Savior, knowing that we can't save ourselves. We are not saved by our good works. We are not saved, as we just read with the Apostles' Creed. We are not saved because our mom and dad had faith in Jesus too, and we grew up in a Christian home. We are saved by faith through Jesus Christ alone. And the Bible says that those who confess that he is Lord and confess their sins and believe in him by faith, you will be saved. And I want to invite those of you who have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ that the day be the day of your salvation. And so what is this message that Jesus is teaching his true followers? As we, over the next couple of months, we're going to see culture and Christianity collide often. They're not antiquated lifestyles. It's not whatever makes you feel happy. If that works for you, go for it. No, these, this message is far bigger than just the way we live. The Sermon on the Mount is a declaration on how followers of Jesus are to live in God's kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is a declaration on how followers of Jesus are to live in God's kingdom. You know that my heart for our church to understand scripture contextually. Meaning, as we're studying the book of Galatians in life groups, and I hope you're a part of a life group studying the book of Galatians, we're going to study the contents of Galatians chapter 3 in light of the entire context of the book of Galatians, right? We're not just going to pick and choose and say, well, this means this, but not, take, and not consider what the whole book is talking about. So when we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we have to look at the broader context of why Matthew wrote the whole gospel record to begin with. And why did he write this book? To help us know that Jesus is king. Jesus is king. We start in the Genesis chapter 1 with this genealogy. This is Jesus who came from King David. In chapter 2, Jesus is already at odds. Jesus is a baby, a toddler, and he's already at odds with the political kingdoms, right? You think your terrible twos are bad, right? Jesus is disrupting kingdoms on earth. Isn't that crazy? Just his mere presence on earth is disrupting the political landscape. The whole book of Matthew is pointing us to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. If I say the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, it's used the same interchangeably. He is pointing us to a greater kingdom. God's kingdom is not political. It is a heavenly kingdom, which Matthew refers to quite Often. In fact, the gospel records refer to him quite time. 126 times in the ESV translation do we see the phrase the kingdom. That's a significant amount. 
Jesus is letting us know through his teaching that there is a far better kingdom than any kingdom on this earth. And that kingdom belongs to God because God and God alone establishes his kingdom. What does Jesus mean when he refers to the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God? We're going to get into it more in a little bit next week when we talk about Matthew 5, verse 3. But the kingdom of God, in short, in quick summary, refers to the rule and reign of Jesus as king. The rule and reign of Jesus as king. It's important to know that the kingdom of Jesus is in an already but not yet state. We know that Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's present. It's here. But then later on in the Sermon on the Mount, when we talk about prayer, and we spend time praying, and how the Lord prays, he says, pray this, your kingdom come. So how can something be at hand, but something still to come? Because the kingdom of God is a, an already but not yet. Here's how we know this. The Sermon on the Mount is filled with contents of how we are to live in light of still dealing with sin. Anybody still dealing with sin in here? Yeah, all right, we all are. Some of you didn't raise your hand. No need to be embarrassed, okay? We're all dealing with it because we're still living in a fallen world. So Jesus says, hey, if you're, you're doing something sinful, get rid of it. Live like this. Live. This is how you live in the kingdom of God. So we have this already. This is how we live right now in the kingdom of God as we deal with sin. But one day, as Pastor Ben pointed to us last week, there's coming a day when the kingdom of God is fulfilled. And we don't have to live in the kingdom of God while we fight our sin. What a day that's going to be. I can't even imagine what that's going to be like. Like Julie and I were talking through some things last night, and we were talking through the, the, the um, fruit of the Spirit. And we were talking just about just the things that I need to work on and she needs to work on. We're, we're going through these things. And I'm just thinking in light of this point of the sermon that one day in the kingdom of God, when all sin is dealt with and Satan's cast into the lake of fire and it's just us and Jesus for all of eternity worshiping without sin, we're going to know what it's like to love like Jesus loved, to have peace that Jesus talks about, the beatitudes that will begin next week. It's Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the righteous. What he is saying is you can experience some of that now, but one day it's going to be fulfilled for all of eternity. Because God's kingdom, it's already, but it's not quite yet here. Meaning that Jesus' reign doesn't begin later on in the future. Jesus reigns right now. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He is reigning right now. God and God alone establishes his kingdom. Pastor R.C. Sproul tells a story. He was traveling through Europe with his wife. He's going conference to conference. And one of the conferences that he was at, they told him, like, hey, you need to be careful going into Romania because they do not like Americans. So he says, okay. So he gets to the border, and there's the border patrol, and they call him out. So he's like, Great. He gets his passport out, they get their bags, and they say, bags, we want to look through your bags. So he gets his bag, and one of the guards pulls out his Bible, starts leafing through it. And R.C. says, I turned to my wife and said, we are in trouble now. Flipping through the Bible. The guard looks to him and sees the American passport and says, you're not American. And R.C.'s like, I don't know what to do here, because clearly I'm an American. And the guy says, I'm not Romanian. R.C. Sproul still says, I have no idea what's going on. And he says that the guard read him Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven. If from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And R.C. Sproul says, that man understood that our citizenship of the kingdom of heaven is far greater than any citizenship here on earth. And he says, you are free to go. These people are good. Because they understood what it meant to belong to a far greater kingdom. They were able to communicate with past cultural barriers and language barriers, but they understood, hey, we are brothers that belong to a far greater kingdom than this earth has to offer. 
And let me lovingly say this, which is just a nice way of saying I'm about to step on some toes. The state of God's kingdom is not dependent on the state of our union. There are some of us who know more about the policies of people that we despise than we know about the kingdom of God. And I say that because as we go into the Sermon on the Mount, we are going to see that the teaching of God's word clashes with even the good governments that this world has to offer. It is teaching us a far and better and greater kingdom that one day we are going to maybe forget, I don't know, where we lived on earth. I, I think we're just going to be so enamored, enamored by the greatness of God's kingdom. So let's not worry about the things that we don't need to be worrying about today. The Sermon on the Mount does not teach us how to get into God's kingdom, but how to live in God's kingdom. The content is this is how we are to live. It is not a sermon about an ideal life in an ideal world, but it's about the kingdom life in a fallen world. The Sermon on the Mount describes the life of repentance. Jesus' message is a message of repentance. The content of this message, it, as I mentioned earlier, is for those of us who truly seek to follow the Lord in all things. And ultimately, what Jesus is getting at is our hearts. We've talked over the last couple of weeks that our heart is desperately wicked. And with this whole idea of following your heart that the world just throws at us, Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, attacks the heart. Because he loves us. He calls for us to repent. So during this sermon, there's going to be times where it, it hurts. Because he knows what is good for us. He knows that it is good to forsake the sin of our lives, to follow him fully. A life of repentance is a life that has turned from sin and towards Jesus. It looks like the content of the message from the Sermon on the Mount. They are not new rules to be followed, but rather a description of the repentant heart. Jesus speaks to our heart. So throughout this series, there's going to be lots of calls to repent, lots of calls to forsake the sinful lifestyle, and let's encourage one another to live the way Jesus has called us to live, to be faithful to the one who has been always faithful to us. Because for us to live the Sermon on the Mount, it means we're bowing to the authority of King Jesus. I think about what it's going to be like when Philippians 2 is played out. When every tongue will confess, every tongue meaning all tongues that have ever existed, every knee, meaning every knee that's always existed, will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings. We're going to get to be a part of that one day. Everybody, whether non-believer or believer, they're going to bow to the authority of King Jesus. He's going to make himself visible. He's going to show his authority. He's going to speak the words of God. And our only response is going to be to fall on our knees. And that's my prayer for us as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. Is that when we hear the words of Jesus spoken to us 2,000 years ago, recorded in God's word in a few chapters, that our response is, yes, Lord, you know what is best for my life. I bow to your authority. I am not in control. I am not the king of my life. I need you, the good and perfect king, to reign in me. Yes, it means I need to forsake some things, and it's going to be some difficult conversation. In fact, I'm praying that my pastoral counseling load increases because everyone just wants to live like Jesus. 
It means confronting things in the past that we're still holding on to because we're not willing to let bitterness or anger go. But when we see Jesus speak, we say, Jesus, your words have more authority than mine, and I want to submit and bow to you and you alone. It's going to confront idols, and it's good. Maybe next year, instead of bringing gifts, we'll bring idols to burn. I don't know. <laughs> but ultimately, every word of this sermon is Jesus saying, see me as king. Herod is not king. Rulers, they're not king. They serve for just a little while. I reign forever. And those who understand and follow the king of Jesus, King Jesus, are faithful subjects to the king. Because our heart sees the heart of Jesus for us and wants nothing else. And it begins next week by saying, blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, for yours, is the kingdom of heaven. Grace Life, let's be faithful. Faithful to the one who has always, 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 always faithful to us. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word that it does not return void. Thank you for its sufficiency, for its clarity. Thank you for the truth it contains. It is from your word that we know who you are. And your heart for your glory and to save sinners like us. Lord, the life of holiness is a life that is often rejected, ignored, laughed at. But we see from your words that we are ta to take the life of holiness seriously that these words are not suggestions. They are not outdated. They are descriptions of how we are to live today. And Holy Spirit, I know that you will convict the deepest, darkest corners of our hearts. Draw out our sin. Help us to see it for what it is, a disgrace disgusting, disgusting presence to a holy God and convict us in such a way for us to get rid of it through your power so that we can freely follow you. Lord, I pray that if there is someone here today whether they are been a part of our church for a few weeks or for eight years or somewhere in between, that if they have not first repented of their sin, I pray that today will be the day that they repent and by faith believe in your finished work on the cross and from the grave for the forgiveness of their sins. Holy Spirit, do a work in them that only you can do Help them to see that it's not my faith or their parents' faith or someone else's faith that saves them. It's not their works that save them, Lord. It is only you, Jesus, that can save them from their sins. And I pray for our church to live out our salvation the way you have graciously shown us how to. Lord, we have seen you, we have heard you, we know you, we know your authority, we know your words. Help us to behold you for who you are, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Help us to live out the life of repentance, a life that's not about us, but it's fully about 
our King. We are thankful that you rule in our lives now and tomorrow. And for all of eternity, your kingdom, we pray, will come soon. Until then, Lord, help us to live out the repentance in your kingdom here. We know that our citizenship is in heaven, waiting for us the blessed presence of the triune God. We look forward to that day. So keep, help us to keep our eyes on you and to by faith believe that your words are good and you are who you say you are. We are thankful for your faithfulness to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to do something just a little different as we sing today. We're going to stand and sing, but maybe you need to just come and just kneel before the Lord and confess, Lord, I haven't been living out the repented life. Maybe you have been unfaithful to the one who's always faithful to you. When we hear God's word spoken to us, there is a call to respond there is always a call to respond. To leave here and not to respond to God's word is to not hear God's word. So whether you come forward and kneel at the stage or you sit in your chair or you stand, respond to God's word today. Let's stand together.
As we stick around to celebrate with cupcakes, let us remember that we're celebrating God's faithfulness to our church and to us as individuals. God bless.